as an application of the chain rule with the natural logarithm. We want to sketch the graph of the function f of x equal to natural log of the absolute value of x squared minus x. In a previous problem, we sketched the graph of g of x equal to natural log of x squared minus x. So we'll want to take note of how the problem changes. Now, in our previous problem, our final graph looked like this. So what will happen when we put the absolute value signs in? We're going to pick up a piece between 0 and 1. Now, the big question is, how do we deal with the absolute value sign? So there are two approaches we can use. First approach, we can just remove the absolute value sign completely by going to a piecewise defined function. So let's see how we do that. Now, note, I want a definition for absolute value of y. So if y is greater than or equal to zero, we take the absolute value, we just return our number. We do nothing at all. If y is negative, I want to remove the minus sign. I could do that by multiplying by a minus one. So when we're negative, we're just going to return minus y. That means if I take absolute value of x squared minus x, when x squared minus x is greater than or equal to zero, we leave it alone. If x squared minus x is negative, we multiply by minus one, which gives me x minus x squared. Of course, we want to sort this stuff out on the right, so what will we do? We find where x squared minus x is zero, so it's zero and one, we mark off our points, then I check a point in each region to get the sign on that region. So if I check at minus one, a half, and two, we'll get positive, negative, and then positive. So if we go to natural log of absolute value of x squared minus x, we would have natural log of x squared minus x when x is less than zero or greater than one. We'll have natural log of x minus x squared if x is between zero and one. Note we don't have the endpoints because natural log of zero is not defined. Now, our first approach will get us to the graph of the function just fine, but we don't need to be so hasty in getting rid of the absolute value. So, we have our function. If I want to find the domain, natural log of y is defined wherever y is greater than zero. So for the domain, we'll have wherever absolute value of x squared minus x is greater than zero. That's going to happen for all x except the ones that make the inside function exactly equal to zero. So I want to throw away where x squared minus x equals zero, or x equal to zero and one. So that's our domain, x not equal to zero and one. You'll note that agrees with the domain for the piecewise defined function from the previous board. Now, what's happening at zero and one? Well, if we take a look at natural log of y, as we approach zero from the right, the graph of natural log of y has a vertical asymptote at zero. Our function is going to go to minus infinity as we approach zero from the right. So we're going to have vertical asymptotes for x equal to zero and one. That takes care of the domain. Let's look at increasing and decreasing. So for that, we'll need the first derivative. Okay, usually, when I take a look at a composition that has an absolute value on the inside, I'm going to go to a piecewise defined function like we did in approach one. For here, we have a special rule for the derivative that takes care of the absolute value. So that is, we take the derivative of natural log of the absolute value of box, we're just going to take one over box times box prime. So, this looks just like the derivative for natural log of box. The only difference is going to be in the domain of your final derivative. Okay, let's apply that to our function here. So we just forget about the absolute values, take the inside, flip it over, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So we have 2x minus 1 over x squared minus x. If I want increasing and decreasing, I want to find the critical points. 
Those are the points where our derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. Now, if we're looking for where it's equal to zero, it's where the numerator is equal to zero, so we'll get x equal to a half. Then if I put a half into our original function, okay, we're gonna have natural log of 1 fourth. Put it in a calculator, that's roughly gonna be minus 1.4. So that'll be one point on our graph when we start sketching. Now, for does not exist, okay, if we take a look at where that happens, that'll be where our denominator is equal to zero. So it's gonna be x equal to zero and one. We've already accounted for those as our vertical asymptotes. So we have one critical point at x equal to one half. Now, if we want increasing and decreasing, take the real line, we break up a region by the critical point and the two vertical asymptotes. Then we're gonna check a point in each region. Then that tells us to sign on the entire region. So it'll be increasing if positive, decreasing if negative. Okay, if I wanna check a point in each region, we'll go with minus one, one quarter, three quarters, and two. So we'll have minus, plus, minus, plus. So I have decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing. And that takes care of our increasing and decreasing for the graph. Now that we have the regions of increasing and decreasing, let's look for the regions of concavity. For that, we'll need the second derivative. So, get our first derivative using chain rule natural log. Second derivative we'll get using the quotient rule. It's always worth reviewing the memory trick for the quotient rule. So, if I call the numerator high, the denominator low, our saying is low d high less high d low over low squared. So if I have low d high, low is x squared minus x, d high or the derivative of high is just two. Less high d low, so we have minus, we have high is two x minus one, d low or the derivative of low is also two x minus one, then over low squared. Now. When we simplify the numerator, we get this quadratic. And if we apply the quadratic equation, there are gonna be no zeros. So, the only places that we can change from concave up to concave down and vice versa is where the denominator is equal to zero. That's gonna be exactly where we have our vertical asymptotes. So, take the real line. We split it up along the vertical asymptotes. And then to check concavity, we're gonna look at a point in each region with the second derivative. So I'll choose minus one, one half, and two. And we note in each case, at the second derivative, they're all gonna be negative. So we have concave down everywhere. The final thing we need for the graph is the end behavior. So if I let x go up to plus or minus infinity, absolute value of x squared minus x goes up to plus infinity, we put that into natural log. As y goes to plus infinity, natural log of y goes to plus infinity also. So if we look at the graph of natural log, as we go off to the right, that goes to plus infinity. So as we go off to plus or minus infinity, our graph is gonna shoot off to plus infinity on both ends. Now, we just have to connect all the different pieces so if we're less than zero, we're decreasing and concave down. We're going off to plus infinity as we go to the left. As I go to the right, we're gonna to come to this vertical asymptote. And so we have to go to minus infinity. If we're to the right of one, we're gonna be increasing and concave down. As I go to the right, we're going to plus infinity. As we come into one, we're going down to minus infinity at the vertical asymptote. So that'll look like this. Then, from zero to one, that's gonna be the new piece. We're gonna go from increasing to decreasing through a critical point. We're gonna be concave down, and we have to hook up with the vertical asymptotes on both sides. So again, asymptotes, as we approach, we're going down to minus infinity. So that's the graph of our function, and we compare with the old graph. All we're doing is picking up this middle piece here. 